then uh, we'll start on uh, this topic of uh, volume factors. Uh, this uh, volume factor is a quantity that is used a lot in petroleum engineering. Um, its symbol is capital B. Um, and sometimes, less frequently, uh, the lowercase uh, b is, is used for the volume factor. And the lower case b is just by definition the inverse of the actual volume factor. So it would be an inverse volume factor. Um, what do we mean by factor? It, it really is talking about a ratio, a volume ratio. But there are quite a few different volume ratios. And uh, this, um, this term volume factor uh, B uh, is, is never referred to as a volume ratio. It's uh, generally a, a volume factor. And what you'll see more common than volume factor, uh, the terminology for it is actually formation a volume factor, but we're going to talk in a, a little more generic sense what is a volume factor, and it doesn't have to refer to the volume factor down in the formation or the reservoir. So formation, what that means, formation volume factor, which is the typical term for this. Um, the, not the symbol, but the, the shortcut of uh, formation volume factors F V F. Um, what we mean by formation is a reservoir um, at reservoir conditions. It's basically the reservoir rock is, is what we call a, uh, uh, the formation. And in this rock we've got pores uh, and in the pores is the water uh, oil and or gas that we're interested in, okay? Um, reservoir rock, um, uh, it's not the rock itself, but it's the, uh, the, the pores in the rock. Okay? So, <clears throat> But we can also talk about other kinds of volume factors that are not referenced down to the to the reservoir, and so that's why I'll just I'll talk more generally about a volume a volume factor B. Um, so there are basically three uh, three uh, volume factors you have for each phase, the gas phase, uh, the oil phase, and the water phase that we operate with. So we've got a gas formation volume factor, which is what we're going to talk about for the most part here in the first hour, and then we've got um, formation volume factor for each phase. So we typically have a, uh, a subscript identifying the phase. And so Those are the three. And the, the generic definition that I'll give you for this uh, uh, volume factor is um, the volume of a particular phase. Okay, and I'll just um, uh, maybe I'll just write it uh, as um, P for phase. So it's the volume of that phase at some pressure and temperature. Okay? P is just, it's one of these phases gas, oil, or water. So you've got a phase, uh, you've got a measure of its volume at a particular pressure and temperature. 
Okay? So let's just say that it's got this. So this is at some pressure and temperature. Um, we might do our particular phase. So it's got some volume that we've, we've got here. And that's the volume of the phase at the pressure and temperature, which I'll write like this. And then if you take that phase to the conditions more or less in this room, ambient conditions, okay, or standard conditions is what we refer to it as. So if we take this phase in some, some way or another, by hook or by crook, if you will, and this process by which we bring it to, to standard conditions, okay, this is called the, the process of bringing <coughs> the phase to the surface conditions or the standard conditions. This would sometimes be called standard conditions or maybe surface conditions. Uh, the surface of the ocean, it's generally referred to the, the pressure at, at uh, sea level. Um, and sometimes I'll refer to this, not very often, but you might hear it as ambient. And what ambient means is just kind of the conditions that people live in. It's the local conditions you know, around one atmosphere uh, pressure and whatever temperature it is where you are. But we're going to talk about uh, what we call standard conditions and we're going to be a little bit specific about that uh, set of standard conditions. So we've got some phase gas or oil or water by some process we haven't talked about we bring that material to standard conditions. Okay. And when we do that, we often will will result in um, we may result in not just that phase. Let's say we start with oil. When we get to the surface, we won't only end up with just oil at the surface, at the standard conditions, we'll probably end up with a surface oil, a surface gas, might even be a little bit of surface water there, okay? So you might get several products, surface products, out of this phase. And you typically do. You get more than one product at the surface, at standard conditions, than what you start with. Okay? So an oil will typically yield both a surface gas and a surface oil. A, a gas down at pressure and temperature might easily yield certainly a surface gas, but it also might yield, yield a little bit of surface oil and maybe some surface water. So the products at the surface condition after going through this process will be multiple. There will be several of them. But this definition of the volume factor is the ratio of the volume that you start with for a particular phase at a pressure and temperature divided by the volume of that same phase. But that bar on top of it is going to indicate it's at standard conditions. Okay? So like if you start with Equifisk oil at, at 7,000 psi, which is about, I don't know, 600 bar, 500 and some bar, at 280 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 130 degrees C. In Equifisk in 19, whenever it was they discovered it, around 1968, 70, discovered this. And if you take that oil to the surface, you're only going to get about, for every cubic meter you take out of the reservoir, you're only going to get about a half a cubic meter of sellable surface oil. Okay? You're only going to get about half of that same volume. You take out a cubic meter from the reservoir and you get about a half a cubic meter of sellable oil. 
And back in 1970, the price of oil was, you know, $12 or something. In addition to that, you got a whole bunch of gas, surface gas. And back in 1972 or 4, I don't remember, 72, I think, when they first started producing Ecofisk from four subsea template wells, the gas, they didn't have anywhere to put it. They couldn't flare it. And so they had to re-inject it into the reservoir. But the point is that they started with an oil in the reservoir conditions, and it yielded a stock tank oil, a, a lot of stock tank gas, surface gas. It also yielded some water, surface water. The water was probably cleaned and dumped to the ocean. I don't know. And the gas was put through a compressor and re-injected into the reservoir. But in the case of Equifisk, we would be talking about, you know, reservoir, that would be formation oil of oil factor. It's the oil phase in the reservoir yielding a stock tank or a surface oil at, the, at, at surface conditions. So we're also going to sometimes refer to the standard conditions as stock tank. Okay. And these standard stock tank conditions are, uh, in the petroleum industry, are generally, um, most places in the world, standardized. Okay? Certainly within the Society of Petroleum Engineers, which is the international society with about 100,000 members, of which you guys should join because it's free as students, I think. In that Society of Petroleum Engineers, which we call the SPE, they defined uh, the standard conditions as one atmosphere, which is the same as 14.696 pounds per square inch, which is the same as 1.0135 bar, which is the same as 1.0135, 10 to the fifth Pascal, which you guys think in terms of, and a temperature of 60 degrees Fahrenheit which is 15, approximately 15.56 degrees C. That is standard conditions. Now in Brazil, standard conditions uses 20 degrees C. Okay, the, Ameri the, the, the North American United States have not been able to figure out how to force the, the Brazilians to use 60 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, instead they use 20 degrees C. So there's a little bit of, you know, variation. But if the Brazilians publish a paper in this International Society of Petroleum Engineers journal, they have to convert their volumes from the 20 degree C to the 15.56 degree C. And if you don't think it matters, when you get a job and you start getting a check every month for salary, the amount that it matters in terms of volumes, the 15.56 to 20, I guarantee you're going to catch if your employer says, oh, we rounded in this direction, okay, we made this assumption, okay, you're going to react because you're going to know what you should be paid, okay? So it does make a difference. So this P with that, the bar on it, so it's the same phase as we start with, but this is that, I'm going to write it SC, standard conditions, and we now know what standard conditions are. One atmosphere, 14.696 PSIA and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This is our formal definition of a volume factor. Any questions? So this is at, using the same nomenclature in parentheses, that volume is at a pressure of PSC, which is what I'm, all of these are, PSC, and this is what I refer to as TSC.
and the little b, which is the inverse formation volume factor, or the inverse volume factor, is just the reciprocal of that. Okay, I don't need to write that for you, because it's given here. It's just a definition. It's just the inverse of that. Okay? So what is the initial formation volume factor of oil for the Equifisk field? What is the initial formation volume factor of oil for the Equifisk field? Hmm? Yeah. You started, okay, on top there, we started with one cubic meter at reservoir conditions, and at the surface conditions, the standard conditions, we got a half a cubic meter. So it was one divided by 0.25, so the oil formation volume factor was two. Exactly. And it's pretty close to that. Okay. Now, Sometimes the little b term, sometimes it's referred to as a shrinkage factor. It's not a particularly good term, but sometimes it's used. This inverse volume factor. And that's because the, it, it represents, in the case of the Equifisk, what is the Equifisk initial oil shrinkage factor? According, if I, if I call little b a shrinkage factor, which sometimes it's usually called, what is that value for Equifisk? 0.5. Okay, so what it's saying is that the oil is shrinking by 50%, okay? Well, it's not quite, it, it is saying that. <clears throat> but let's say that you had another field, let's say Gulfox, that had a formation volume factor, oil volume factor, initial, let's say of 1.5, okay? instead of two. And what would the units be? Well, the units would be cubic meter per cubic meter, right? But we don't write it that way. The way we write it is cubic meters per standard cubic meter, uh, cu standard cubic meter. And this is something in petroleum you have to get used to, that we often connect a descriptor of pressure temperature to the unit. It's not allowed in SI, but we do it, okay? So the big S, sometimes it might be written STD, cubic meters, um, or with the same unit, we might say this is in cubic feet. Well, we wouldn't use that for oil, so I'm not going to even go there. But we might say reservoir barrel per stock tank barrel. That is what the most of the petroleum engineers in the world would use for the unit of form, formation volume oil formation volume factor. This is the most common thing you'll see in the, in our industry. So the big B means barrel. Okay, but the R means reservoir. Okay, and the ST means stock tank. Okay, so you can see I'm just confusing the hell out of you, but it's better just to get it over with early, because it it's not going to go away. You chose this, you chose petroleum engineering. It's your fault. Okay, if you wanted physics and SI, you should have chosen uh, fuse med or fuse moth or whatever they call it. Okay, this is going to be your life. You just get used to it. So so the, often the units carry with it what conditions it's at. So reservoir barrel, stock tank barrel. Okay. 
everybody's got a calculator here, right? Because everybody's got a phone, so don't tell me you don't have. You know, I had a period there where everybody had to have calculators because it was so cool to have them back in the late 70s and through the 80s. I mean, it was cool. You know, the guys, they walked around with them on the, you know, the, the belt. It was cool to have a, a calculator. You know, now you guys don't even know what a calculator looks like. You know, you don't buy a calculator except to take the exams here. But everybody has a phone and it also has a calculator. Okay. So what I want you to do with that calculator, and I want everybody doing it, and if I see you not doing it, I'm not going to do anything other than be disappointed. It's not like I do have a belt, but I don't use it. Okay? For that. I want you to calculate how much let's say this is Gulfox, which you're, you know, let's say it's Statford. That's, that's really the biggest uh, in terms of you know, Ecofisk and Statford, they're the biggest in the North Sea. Let's say this is the initial formation volume factor of Statford, some formation 1.5. I want you to tell me what is the little BOI and how much did the oil shrink going from the initial reservoir conditions to stock tank conditions. I didn't ask you for the shrinkage factor little b. I asked you to calculate how much did the oil shrink. Okay? You know what I mean? So if we took one cubic meter of this Statfjord oil and then we end up with some standard cubic meters at the surface, I want to know what percentage uh, shrinkage did that oil experience? Okay? So everybody take five minutes or so to do that calculation. So the first thing you can calculate is BOI. That's easy. But then I want you to calculate the shrinkage of the initial oil volume going to the final surface stock tank oil volume. Okay? How much did it shrink? If I started with the 100 barrels in the reservoir, how many barrels did I get at the surface? And the difference in those two numbers is kind of the percentage shrinkage. Not the shrinkage factor, but the shrinkage. Okay, is there anything not clear? <clears throat> anything not clear? So what is the what is the inverse formation volume factor here? Point six. I'm just gonna round off point did well I bad practices at 0.667, at least three significant digits. That's good engineering. Minimum three significant digits, probably never more than five in general. So 0.667, and that would have units, for example, stock tank barrel per reservoir barrel, or it might have units of standard cubic meter per uh, cubic meter, something like that. And that's what we might, even though it's not a good term, terminology, we might call that, oh, the shrinkage factor is this 0.67, or you might even say 67%. But how much has the oil actually shrunk? 33%, right? So the natural thing, if you're going to call something a shrinkage factor, you would say that's 33%. Okay, but that would involve calculation of one minus B. That would be true shrinkage, right? That would actually be shrinkage. Well, you know, in the old days when people started, 
you know, doing these calculations, uh, you know, they didn't have calculators, they had slide rules and they had their heads. So it was easier just to say, oh, it's 67% it's of the volume it used to be. Okay? It's 67% of the volume it used to be. Instead of saying, oh, it lost 33%. I mean, you kind of understand one from the other. But the actual physical shrinkage is 1 minus little b. So, so these are all terms. So that would be, in this case, about 33.3%. Okay. Any questions? It's kind of generic. Now, most of you know that oil or liquid, right? Most of you know from intuition that if you take an oil at 7,000 psi, 500 bar, something like that, and you bring it to one bar, what's going to happen if we just take some liquid and do that? We take our water and we pressure it up to 500 bar, and then you go and you have one cubic meter of this pressurized water, and then you take it to one atmosphere. What happens to the volume of that water? It's going to expand. Huh? It's going, it's going to expand by a few percent. But here, we're starting with this uh, oil, 500 bar, and we're bringing it to the surface, and we're getting half or a Two-thirds of, of what you get at the surface is what you started with. Why is it shrinking? Huh? Yes, and water and surface separated from oil, and in the reservoir condition, it's all together from nature. Okay. Anybody else want to try to explain it in different terms? It's, it's not wrong. But did you understand what he said? Okay. The fact that what we start with becomes multiple products at the surface, okay, usually. In this case, the reservoir oil is becoming a stock tank oil we can sell for, well, if it's today, $111 per barrel. It's also coming out with a lot of gas. Probably in the case of Ecofisk, it would be about for every barrel of oil, you'd have about 2,000, 1,500 standard cubic feet of gas. Maybe uh, for every cubic meter of stock tank oil from Equifish, you'd be getting about uh, 300 standard cubic meters of gas that you could sell at a different price. So you're losing mass, okay? A lot of mass in this case. And the fact that the mass disappears, in other words, you transform it from an oil into an oil and a gas, maybe a little bit of water, means that what is left as a stock, stock tank surface oil is going to be a lot less volume. So all of this shrinkage effect is coming not because of the change in pressure from 500 bar to 1 bar, but it's coming because of the loss of mass or material. It doesn't stay as an oil. It's ends up being an oil and a gas and maybe a little bit of water. So it's the fact that it's losing mass is why it's shrinking. Okay? Which is what he said in more concise terms. Okay? So that's why this, this shrinkage is... Uh, now it doesn't always happen that way. It does for oil. For oil that's the way it works. So you actually get this volume factor being larger than 1. Okay. So we've covered the generic definition. We've talked about it for oil. And um, hopefully we'll just make a note that the shrinkage of oil at 
pressure and temperature to a lesser oil, um, we'll call it stock tank oil, at stock tank conditions, that's these conditions, is due to um, the loss of mass at <coughs> the surface conditions becoming surface gas. So that's most of where that shrinkage uh, comes from. But isn't that shrinkage due to uh, the pressure? Well, there's, there's an effect of um, the oil. If there was no gas product, then the oil would expand because of the pressure reduction, right? Yeah. And the temperature reduction, what, the, what would that do to the oil volume? it would reduce it. So there would be compensating. And whether the temperature or the pressure wins out depends on the compressibility, uh, uh, the, basically the compressibility of the, of the oil in terms of pressure or temperature. So, so in theory, it could have no change in volume if there was no gas product. So. But in this case, in general, for oils, the loss of, of the, the creation of a gas phase at surface conditions will almost always create a shrinkage of the oil. That is, the formation volume factor B of O is almost always greater than 1. There's almost always a, a net shrinkage of that oil. So a high shrinkage factor and the range of the BO for, for reservoirs at, from initial conditions to um, around the world, the range of that can be anywhere close to 1, I'm just going to put plus there, just above 1, all the way to as much as, and this is unusual, 4. Typically, it's less than about two and a half for, for the majority of reservoir oil reservoirs in the world. So typically, this ranges from, let's say, 1.2 to 2.5. Certainly in the North Sea, that would be the typical range. But you have extreme cases where it can reach as much as four. That means you get a quarter of the cubic meter at the surface for every cubic meter you take out of the reservoir. Is that good or bad? Is a high oil formation volume factor, is that good or bad? In terms of money, making money. <laughs> bad because? You're getting less oil, you're getting more gas. Gas yeah. price is less than oil price. Yeah. So, so that transform material into gas gives less money in the bank. So that's a simplified way of looking at it. That's the way the CEOs look at it. Okay, that's the way, you know, the high-level managers look at it. At least the ones who probably don't deserve to be there. They think, oh, a high shrinkage factor or, or a high formation volume factor. That's not a good thing. <coughs> But those of you who are reservoir engineers and maybe even the production engineers realize that that gas that's coming out of the oil can be very helpful in helping you recover more of the oil. So there might be other things than the simple shrinkage effect that are positive, that compensate the shrinkage effect. And, and so it's not... You can't just say, oh, it's a high formation volume factor, that's bad. 
because that high formation volume factor does mean that there will be a lot of gas coming out of solution. But sometimes that gas can be a great way to help us get more of the oil produced from the reservoir. Okay? And if you have an oil reservoir with no gas in solution, okay, meaning that BO is about one, it's only the pressure temperature effect. The recovery of the oil by just producing it by depletion would be a two percent. You'd only get you'd almost the expansion is just so little. Okay? You don't get much oil because it doesn't expand very much by pure compressibility effects. So that would be terrible recovery. So it's not easy to say simply that a high or a low oil formation volume factor is good or bad. It's like the rest of life, you know. <laughs> Having curly hairs, maybe you think it's bad, but it could be a very useful thing. Uh, you know, everything is like that. And in this case, it's for sure that um, the gas that you have in the oil lowers the viscosity, higher oil rates. Okay? All right. So what we'll do is we'll take a break, and then after the break, I'm going to ask you to derive this gas volume factor, okay, from the basic ideal gas law. That's what we're going to work on next hour, since you listened to the video on ideal gas law.